let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as many of you may or may not know, uh, my name is Brooks Bonner. I am the Director of Community Engagement and Enrollment Management for the Organization for Tropical Studies. And uh, today we are happy to um, kickstart our new initiative called Trop Talks, um, which is a new format where we're going to be sharing a lot of the cutting edge research, cutting edge research um, um, about in that's going on in and around our programs um, and our field stations, both in South Africa and Costa Rica, uh, being done by OTS staff, uh, but as well as uh, people that come, researchers use our stations, as well as just the broad OTS community. So uh, this first uh, talk today uh, is going to be done by um, a man many of you know. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Kruger, who is the uh, director, uh, curriculum and uh, program manager, uh, program director for OTS South Africa. Uh, he's going to be talking about the elephants of Kruger, which uh, many of you, I think we have a few alumni in this call that probably had some firsthand experience with. But um, just to give you a quick idea uh, of how this format's going to work, um, Lawrence is going to talk for a while, go through a few slides, and then at the end, there will be an opportunity. Um, for people to ask questions uh, of Dr. Kruger. And if you are familiar with Zoom, there's a, a way that you can raise your hand uh, at the end of, that, of the call. You raise your hand, I can unmute you, and you can ask your question in front of the group. If you're, if you're feeling shy, you can also put it in the chat space, and we'll try to get to those questions uh, at the end of the talk. So um, I will, um, Lawrence, if you want to go ahead and get your, uh, start sharing your screen i'll stop sharing mine we can get this ball rolling all righty how's that firstly welcome everybody just nice to see some familiar faces and nice to see some new names um i guess the the point of today's talk is is um well, then, uh, threefold. The one is to tell you a little bit about um, the ecology of management of elephants in the Kruger National Park, but also to um, speak um, about the kind of data that OTS students have been collecting over the years. And today's presentation really does focus on primarily on the work that our students have, have done and the data they've collected and the work we've published. And then also to give um, the students that are new to OTS just some sense of, of um, how your experience in OTS might um, influence your, you know, your future careers and so on. And so um, without further ado, um, the, one of the, the major challenges we face right now um, in Southern Africa is, is what we've now termed the paradox of conserving elephants. Um, and so today I'm just gonna take you through some of the data um, whether we look at the effects of elephants on, uh, uh, on biodiversity and then just how the, the Kruger managers have responded to these data and how we are managing elephants at the moment. So on the one hand, um, where elephants are not protected, uh, we see a precipitous decline in their numbers. Um, and the graph uh, on the top left-hand side of your screen, um, that's a, a, um, a representation of all the conservation, major conservation areas in Africa and those that are colored brightly red indicate um, declining populations and um, gradation through to the, the the bright green which would which suggest um, increasing populations and if you and most of uh, the, the southern parts of South Africa um, it would or southern Africa would suggest that elephants are doing really well whereas in the rest of their distribution uh, apart from blocks in East Africa not so well and uh, this is only accelerating for much of Africa, um, whereas the opposite is happening down south. And the paradox comes in is where elephants are conserved effectively, it would seem that they're now starting to have a, uh, a negative impact on uh, biodiversity in these ecosystems. And so we'll take you through uh, some of those details as we go now. So all of this is against the, the backdrop of um, a global loss of big trees um, for a variety of reasons. And being a, uh, a big tree ecologist and a, and a botanist, obviously my, my first uh, point of departure with a lot of this work would be uh, from a vegetation perspective. And over the years of working with uh, students that are 
possibly more interested in, uh, in animals initially, but not by the end of the program, Joey. Um, we, um, you know, I've been drawn into some of the biodiversity related questions. But anyhow, so globally we see a, a decline in big trees due to logging, climate change, land use change, and otherwise. And that's certainly pretty extreme in some of the savanna systems as well. And uh, probably the key bit of work done um, in the last 10 years was work done by Greg Asner from uh, um, Stanford who, um, while most of us have been doing a lot of uh, um, field work at, at a fairly small scale, Greg introduced us to the world of, of live uh, uh, laser imagery um, to assess the change in vegetation across the whole of the Kruger Park. And um, so I'll just start with some of the fundamentals and then go into some of the details. So why big trees? Why should we bother about this? In the first place, those who know me well um, have certainly been indoctrinated. But in essence, um, the largest trees in the landscape would be considered to be uh, keystone structures, keystone species, uh, in the sense that they uh, result in significant resource hotspots. And uh, it's a consequence of uh, hydraulic lift from their root systems, accumulating you know, nutrients through um, uh, beneath a canopy from litter fall, um, but also the, uh, the change in microclimate beneath the, the tree becomes really important. Important. This has significant um, trophic cascades. Um, we see shifts in animal behavior in heavily wooded areas. Uh, herbivores prefer the shade and, and the forage beneath the trees. And some really remarkable work done by Anna Tractor in uh, East Africa um, has outlined just how important this can be. Um, and there's this positive feedback between animals grazing beneath the um, the improved forage quality beneath the, the canopy of the trees, the longer they spend in those um, or beneath those canopies, the more they defecate and urinate. And in so doing, you see this positive feedback. And uh, um, so these, not only is it nutrient rich, but also you typically have uh, far moister soils beneath the, the canopy of trees. A uh, great deal of work has been done on the link between bird communities and, and birds, so much like the work done by MacArthur and Wilson and Mark McCody and the forests of, of Southern Africa, um, we've, we've, we've started doing that work in, in the Kruger and um, it's particularly, well, what, it's some of the work that's seen a lot of attention is, is the work on vultures nesting in the bigger trees, uh, but of late we also um, have found some important relationships between vegetation structure and bats. And uh, the small mammal world is a little bit um, uh, less certain, uh, but certainly it seems that, that big trees can also influence uh, small mammal communities. Um, and as far as plants go, we all know about shifting community dominance. And, and uh, um, if you lose big trees, you tend to see quite significant shifts in plant communities. And of course, then you see these trickle down effects. And so, um, you know, it's images like these that have really got the, the managers in the Kruger Park um, and all around Africa quite concerned. So this is actually work done by uh, a sand parks researcher, Holger Eckhart, back in the early 90s. And at the time, he was, um, his work was quite heavily criticized because we felt it wasn't detailed enough. And um, this is a whole, I think there's some 300 fixed point photographs or fixed point photograph locations around the Kruger Park. And so what he did was through repeated photography, um, show the loss of these big trees all across the park. And we criticized him because we felt that, um, you know, it's a snapshot, it's a, it's a very limited view, and, it, you know, who's to say what's happening outside of the, the frame? And um, it turns out he was right, and it's just good to see him vindicated years later. Um, but it's images like these that, that would really get the, um, the managers concerned. Another one would be, uh, this is a photograph in the, from the north of the park um, of a roan enclosure. And these, this 30 hectare fenced off area was built to um, examine why some of the rare antelope were declining in the, in the Kruger Park. So inside this fenced off area um, essentially only had uh, animals smaller than a rabbit and a roan. Um, no predators, no competitors. Uh, but it, it provided the perfect opportunity to, for uh, sort of comparative studies because uh, both sides of the fence burn at the same fire regime. But the only major difference here 
um, would be the, the difference in herbivore densities. And, and certainly you can see quite a big change in, or quite a big difference in the large tree density. And the argument is that's primarily driven by, by elephants. So managers seeing um, images like this certainly start to become very concerned. And the data emerging from uh, Greg Azza's work um, certainly supported some of these findings uh, and, and, and supported some of these, not fears, but concerns. And uh, this is just, just uh, the image in the top left is representation of what the data looked like. So um, they flew uh, one tenth of the park uh, three times, so 2008, 2010, and 2012. And these data are comparing um, the LIDAR flights from 2008 to the LIDAR flights in 2012. And um, it's just a before and after image of exactly the same place. And using the laser image, you can reconstruct uh, the vegetation structure. And Bree, being a termite biologist, will be very happy about that termite mound, which is also um, captured by the LIDAR. And in essence, what we found over um, this change, this period of change, was that there are some 215,000 additions, so um, places where you see greater vegetation biomass or tree biomass um, after four years versus over 800,000 um, individual trees that were lost from these systems. And that represents a significant loss, and that's only 10% of the park and uh, over a four year period. So it certainly would indicate uh, some significant losses. Thanks to some incredible work done by the students and uh, each one of these slides represents another little element that a, a group of students has, has, has worked on. Uh, and the, the, the mechanism of this loss is this interaction between um, elephant browsing um, towards the end of the, the, the dry season and fire. In essence, um, elephants are mixed feeders so early in the in the wet season there'd be grazers and um, this will last until the end of the wet season um, when they start switching to uh, forage so become browsers they focus on the leaves focus on the branches and towards the end of the dry season particularly in drought periods they will start stripping off bark to get at the, the cambium and the phloem and this image in the top left indicates um, some recent um, elephant stripping of an acacia um, then a whole suite of uh, boring insects um, often will start to penetrate the, the xylem. Um, some of the bepressed and the um, longhorn beetles that I've shown there, um, they perforate the xylem and that renders it a bit more uh, um, flammable. Um, intense fires might burn through and then we start to see um, the effects on the right hand side. So this is actually one of my favorite marilla trees that has remained standing for about 15 years. So every year I come past and it's burnt a little bit more and yet it keeps standing. Uh, but it's the images on the far right that really get people concerned because adult trees, um, once they get to about 10 centimeters, are, are no longer vulnerable to being burnt. And it's only if the bark is stripped um, that, that they actually start to burn. And this is a, some really neat work done by um, students in the past. So we know that elephants are important, um, but there was a, a fabulous opportunity to study the influence of fire. And um, so strongly encouraged by William Bond, uh, the Sand Park's fire ecologist um, set up an experiment called the Firestorm Experiment. So most burns, most um, fire regimes are um, particularly in conservation areas or where prescribed burning is important, uh, are relatively safe fires. And what I mean by that is they they adhere to what they call the 30, 30, 30 rule. So 30 degrees, below 30 degrees Celsius, below 30 kilometers an hour wind speed and above 30% humidity. And that's the same the world around, whether it be in Australia or North America, you typically burn uh, when it's safe. Um, the problem is that your, uh, your burn regime becomes quite homogenous then. And uh, the argument is that there are not enough of these cataclysmic fires. Um, so William convinced the managers to uh, set a sequence of burns, and there's a very neat opportunity um, south of, of Skukuzo, where they burnt um, in, in, in a sequence of two fires. Um, in some places, they burnt with two cool fires, in some places, two extremely hot fires, hence the name firestorm. In some areas, first a cool, then a hot, in others, first a hot, and then a cool. And so it's a really neat platform for understanding the effects of, of very intense burns. And so Greg 
um, flew with LIDAR in 2010, 2012, and 2014, uh, so to cover those two sequences of bones. And what they found is in a sequence of two cool burns, there's only a loss of around 3.5% of, of the trees um, over that period, of those, those two fire periods, compared to um, where they burned twice with very intense burns, uh, where they saw a 35% loss of trees. So it's, it's not only the elephant browsing um, and the elephant stripping of bark, but it's also the fire intensity that plays a really important role in, in uh, the declining uh, numbers of big trees in these, in these ecosystems. So where the students really come in, aside from looking at the mechanism stuff, is, is, um, is looking at the, the, the trophic cascades, the, the consequences, the trickle-down effects of, of the loss of big trees. And we've looked at a variety of scales. We've looked at uh, very small scales in the Sabi River. We've worked in the far north of the Kruger Park. And then, of course, in much bigger scales, which I'll talk about in a second. But it's an extravaganza of, of biodiversity surveys. So uh, the OTS alum that have worked with me in the past have certainly had to um, engage in some of this work. And we do small mammal trapping, uh, bird surveys, we've done dung surveys in the past, herpetological work, all kinds. Um, as I say, we've, we've looked at all three scales, the small, the medium, and the very large, but I'm just really going to report on the, the fundamental findings of some of the larger experiments. And this is one of the platforms where to um, encourage, once the students have finished the courses, but to come back and uh, engage in PhD work and otherwise um, is this massive experiment that you set up in collaboration with Sand Parks, uh, the University of Florida and the University of Eswatini in uh, Swaziland, now called Eswatini. And uh, it's a comparative uh, research project um, looking at uh, the southern basalts of the Kruger Park um, which, uh, and comparing that to the northern basalts in Eswatini. And uh, so same soils, same uh, climatic regime, uh, but the major difference is that in Kruger we have uh, all the mega herbivores. And the photograph at the top is an image of the southern basalts, an almost treeless plain, very, dare I say it, um, Serengeti-like, uh, very much like images of the Lion King. And then in the, the image below is what um, the uh, uh, Eswatini looks like. So. So um, same vegetation type, same community dominance, but just vastly different structure. And uh, we've set up um, 25 research plots in the Kruger and some 54 in Swaziland. Birds, bats, small mammals, vegetation structure, vegetation floristics, and a whole suite of other work. Um, and without diving into the details too much, um, what's Critically important for uh, the Kruger Park managers is to um, maximize heterogeneity because um, the argument goes that uh, heterogeneity begets um, biodiversity. So the greater the heterogeneity in the system, uh, the greater the number of niches. And consequently, we could we could do that there'd be uh, a greater species diversity. And this is exactly what you found. So over a period of five years, we've seen a decline in, in vegetation structure and heterogeneity in the Kruger and when we compare it to Swaziland uh, we see quite a big shift in the heterogeneity so on the x-axis we've got um, this heterogeneity index and on the y-axis we've got in this case functional diversity and this is a pattern that you find across all taxa birds bats small mammals across small medium and large scales um, not only for species richness uh, but also the functional diversity so that the, the diversity of in this case, bird functional types. So, um, you know, and, and these are feeding gills uh, primarily, but the same holds for all kinds of other gills. Um, and what you're finding in the Kruger, which are the beige dots, um, where mega herbivores are present, we see with this decline in heterogeneity, we also see a significant decrease in functional diversity. And so herein lies the crux. Um, and, 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 and the, 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 the key issue around the paradox of, of, of managing elephants is, so the elephant population in the Kruger is doing really well, uh, but certainly it's starting to have significant effects on the ecosystem. By reducing heterogeneity, it's also, uh, it's, certainly in the one part of the park, it's starting to have an impact on, on faunal diversity. 
Incidentally, what you're also going to do, and this is again just a, a, a quick plug for um, for you guys that are interested in in uh, graduate studies and otherwise, but you're now also using this as a platform for a number of different PhD and master's programs. And um, this is Maggie's vegetation recovery. So what you've now done in the Kruger is you've built nine fenced exclosures, three of them full exclosures, which keeps everything uh, greater than um, a rabbit out of the uh, out of the plots and then six partial exclosures which just keep mega herbivores out so we've got these 25 sites uh, nine of them have fences on them and in Swaziland we've got very dense vegetation as I mentioned but you're now cutting down um, virtually a hectare of vegetation in nine plots so we we really started to experiment with savannas now um, and just to see how resilient these systems are can they in fact bounce back and Donna and I were just in the field this morning and it's actually quite remarkable to see um, some of these species uh, starting to germinate in these plots and the vegetation structure is changing inside the herbivore exclosure plots. Um, but it's not all bad news. Elephants, we know, play a really important role in, um, in actually, you could almost, almost argue the conservation of savannas um, from um, facilitating, um, you know, access to water for um, other herbivores in, in drought periods by digging holes in riverbeds through to dispersing uh, a number of different species, um, seeds across the landscape. And the two favorite ones would be Marula and Bellanites. And again, this is uh, one of the favorite um, OTS projects. So looking at plant animal interactions and, and species that are dependent on the elephants for, for germination and dispersal. So what has Kruger's response been? Well, in the past, uh, we know about the culling policies that were um, employed from the late 60s to the mid 90s, and then of course changed with the changing uh, politics uh, in South Africa, or the, um, uh, the switch to a demographic South Africa also saw um, a significant change in the elephant management policy, the cessation of, of culling. And this is a graph that was used by the elephant manager at the time to say this alarming increase in elephants. And now in 2020, we see around 22,000 elephants in the Kruger Park. And um, so like all um, strongly managed uh, um, faunal communities, so um, any population that has been culled usually responds by explosive breeding. And certainly we saw uh, significant increases in elephant populations after the culling era. We also know that um, they're transported elephants and, and contracepted elephants. Um, this is just an image of the uh, Transfrontier Park, uh, the brainchild of, of uh, Anton Rupert and Nelson Mandela. The idea was that conservation knows no boundaries. And so um, they established what they call the Peace Park system across Africa. And I believe that's now extended globally. And in our case here, uh, they joined the Kruger Park with the private game reserves to the west and the Limpopo National Park in uh, Mozambique. But also the idea was to create a corridor into Garnerazo National Park. And uh, it's been very successful. So they dropped uh, almost um, a third of the fences between Kruger and uh, Mozambique. And some 2,000 elephants have already moved into uh, Mozambique in the last 10 years. Uh, so that's, that represents a significant exporting of animals. Um, so these interventions work, but the argument now is that they are running out of space. And so um, certainly culling has stopped, contracepting was never feasible in the Kruger Park, and they've dropped about as many fences as they can. And there's also, there are some challenges now with uh, um, rhino poaching and wanting to put the fences back up. And so um, let's talk a little very briefly about some of the Kruger Parks. Um, responses to all of this. So just a little bit about um, the elephant populations in, in, in the Kruger Park. Um, so the elephants of Kruger represent around 4% of Africa's elephants. So actually a, a small proportion, but they tend to use the spaces more intensely because they're fenced. Uh, they tend to breed much quicker. Uh, there's plenty of resources in the landscape and they tend to live longer. Life is pretty easy for the Kruger elephants. And the outcomes have been um, this high growth rate, uh, so greater lambda, but also greater density. And this is what has caused most of the concern uh, for certainly the managers, but not necessarily the scientists. So historically, they've been very intensely managed either through culling or being fenced. 
but because of those cell same fences, um, their human elephant conflict is, is relatively low. And of course, people like to see elephants, which by the way, is one of the reasons they stopped contracepting elephants in, in those pair of nature reserves because they stopped seeing babies in the landscape and the tourists demanded seeing babies, so they stopped contracepting. So all of this has resulted in some fairly nervous managers. And so what they've done now, um, if they've done some really neat work um, on uh, the influence of resources on, on elephant uh, population biology. And so one of the key policies that the, the park has focused on is trying to get elephants to move far greater distances to access water. So they've closed a whole bunch of water points. And Joe, you did some of your work on that. Um, and it's had important effects on elephant breeding. So the suckling calves, if you look at the daily roving distance on the x-axis and the survival index on the y-axis, um, it's had no effect. Um, the sub-adults, those that are between 9 to 12 years, again, there's no relationship between the daily roving distance and the survival index. But when it comes to their recently weaned calves, you start to see a decline in the survival, the survival of these calves the further they have to walk um, to water. And it's just that they can no longer lean on mom. So they no longer um, derive or uh, getting any resources from uh, their mothers and they, they just become a lot more vulnerable. And so by forcing elephants to walk greater distances uh, to access water resources, what they're seeing in some parts of the park now is a declining in the lambda, they're declining in, in the, uh, the growth of the populations. And um, there's also emerging evidence now that a, um, as a sort of a density dependent effect, um, as the populations, and these are local populations within Kruger Park, um, uh, so the, the, the greater the density, um, they're starting to see a decline in, in the population growth rate as well. So that's a double whammy of um, not only are we seeing increased mortality because they have to move further, but also as the, in, in the areas with the, the denser populations, you start to see a decline in lambda. So certainly uh, the reduction in the water points um, and as the, the density of, of, of the animals increase, we, we start to see uh, a decline in numbers. But there's still some concern around um, the elephant numbers increasing in, in the Kruger. And, and here in lies the crux now. So we've done our work in the far south of the Kruger Park. And certainly we're seeing a decline in, in diversity in faunal communities, which is of course for some concern. And our argument is that uh, we're losing big trees in those landscapes. How Kruger has now then incorporated this, this into their thinking is the argument that Kruger is massive and heterogeneous. And so while we might be seeing a decline in the small area in the far southeast of the park, we've got really got to keep our minds um, open to what's happening in the rest of the park. So um, the way they approach this now is monitor the entire park for the change in vegetation structure. And in other parts of the park, we're just not seeing the same rate of decline in vegetation structure. And the argument is we clearly, thanks to the work done by OTS students and a whole range of University of Florida students, this relationship between vegetation structure and, and foreign community is becoming clearer. Uh, but the Kruger's argument is that the Kruger is massive, it's a churchiness, the elephant density varies from substantially across the park, and therefore the ecological effects uh, would vary. And therefore, you, you've got to vary the policy. There's no one size fits all um, uh, policy for the whole of the park. And so at this stage, it's, it's still very much a wait and see um, state. And the, the argument is that uh, we're not seeing these, um, the effect that we're seeing in the southern parts of Kruger, we're not seeing it across the whole park. When that starts to happen, certainly we need to start managing elephants. So the response has been stopping, stopping the large scale killing. Uh, we've stopped the large scale removal because we've just run out of space in Southern Africa, but they've closed the water holes, and they've been blowing up dams. Um, and we've also started consolidating in some of the major areas by removing the fences. And it certainly seemed to be having the desired effect. The challenge though, is we're still waiting to see whether the effects that we see in the south of the park are going to be seen across the whole of the Kruger Park. And so that, that brings me to the end of the talk, um, just a crash course in elephants of the Kruger and the management responses. Um, and a lot of these data are thanks largely to uh, the OTS courses we've run. Um, so to date, there have been 54 courses in the Kruger, some 690 alumni from the program. And over a quarter of those of you guys, um, Miranda, 
uh, Brie, have returned to uh, South Africa. And, and that's, the, that's the real joy of, of running this program is that just so many of our students have returned either as graduate students or as um, research interns. They've come to do some, or well, they've come to the OTS course, has been exposed to these, this fabulous opportunity to engage with some of the top researchers in the country, but also some of the key conservation issues in, in Southern African parks. So great exposure, great research opportunities, but then the trick is always to get you guys to come back to South Africa. And I guess I just to illustrate um, the kind of effects that this has on people's careers, this Deva um, and Scott were students in the very, very first program and Carla is now uh, uh, basically building on doing research in, in the Kruger Park. She's now a professor at Yale um, and is one of the foremost Savannah ecologists. And um, through the OTS program, she was introduced to Southern Africa, to William Bond, and the rest is history. Um, Scott, we're now trying to collaborate um, on, a, on a human capital development program. He's a, a director of a, a program called We Got Next, which is uh, focuses on getting African-American or creating opportunities for African-Americans and people of color um, in the wilderness spaces. He's worked with Knowles and Patagonia on some of these issues and he's now started his own NGO and we're hoping to collaborate to pair up um, people of color from the States with youngsters from South Africa and, and working in the Kruger Park. And then thinking locally, um, Melissa um, has done some remarkable work. Uh, she's wrapped up a PhD now, works for BirdLife Africa and has done work all around Southern Africa on uh, bird conservation. Married to Caroline, who is also an OTS student, is a postdoc at uh, Fitz University. So they enormous opportunities during the program, but certainly after the program. And uh, it's just great to see the effect that the OTS program has had on, on, uh, on people's careers and their, uh, their, their and just a brief, uh, brief mention of this relationship that have with Kruger. We, um, between OTS and Sasani Trust and, and Sand Parks, we've uh, formed this organization called the Skukuza Science Leadership Initiative, which is this platform for partnering in programs, but also for exchange. And that's the platform that we use to uh, support many of you guys to come back to the Kruger. So for the, I think most of the alumni on this talk have, have, have actually attended an OTS course, which was based in, um, at the SSLI. Uh, but that's where any students coming on the program will, uh, will run most of the course. So we spend at least 60% of the time in the Kruger Park and most of that time at the SSLI. And for those of you who are going to come back as grad students, Jessica, uh, we look forward to hosting you here at the SSLI. And that is it. Great. Thank you, Lawrence. I feel like uh, I've, uh, I've seen and heard you talk, I don't know how many times, but each time I do, I still learn something new. So um, it's nice for me. So hopefully everyone else got something out of it as well. Um, but uh, now that that's kind of over, I want to open it up to questions. Um, again, you do want to raise your hand and uh, I will call on you and you can either unmute yourself or I can unmute you. Um, it looks like uh, Vivian has a question. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and go ahead and answer or ask your question. Sure, thank you very much, um, Lawrence. I was just wondering, um, you know, because we hear most of the time that elephants are ecological engineers or ecosystem engineers. And I was just curious why um, in particular, I've seen a lot of elephants, um, you know, I guess knocking down trees, but I'm curious to know why um, after the wet season, they tend to, um, they can also, I guess, scar the trees. Um, and take away some of their bark. And I'm wondering if there's like a difference in why they do that instead of knocking down the trees completely. So this, um, that's actually a good question. We, you know, we haven't been able to adequately answer it. Um, so the reason they, um, they start to scarify the, the trunks of the trees is uh, they're looking for the most uh, nutritious part of the tree. And so by the time you get to um, the end of winter, uh, the forage quality of the leaves has declined dramatically. So, um, and elephants will push over trees, um, and but it's odd that they actually don't feed extensively on the trees. 
and um, we've seen elephants push over a tree and nibble at a couple of roots, nibble at a couple of branches and move on. And there's a particularly dynamic scientist, uh, by the name of Jeremy Midgley, who um, asked this question as to why elephants push over trees. And uh, he would argue that um, it's actually got to do with exercise, they're pumping iron. And uh, it's mostly the, the bulls that push over trees. Um, so the, the, when, the, when the breeding herds move through, they're actually, they're the ones that will break branches and uh, strip off the bark. Um, but it's only really the bulls that push over trees, but they don't do it in close proximity to the females, so they're not, they're not showing off. Um, and one of the arguments is that actually they're just, they, they're practicing it because when elephant bulls fight, they butt heads. And so one of the arguments is that they, they're pumping iron, they're getting fit and strong. Um, but there, there, there are a range of explanations for it. Um, so sometimes it's uh, associated with feeding, but not that often. And so the, the stripping of the bark is that they, they're trying to get to the phloem and the cambium, which is very phosphorus and nitrogen rich and very rich in proteins. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Sure. Looks like uh, Joey has a question. So go ahead, Joey. You are uh, unmuted. Hey, Lawrence. Great seeing you again. Hey, absolutely, Joey. Um, I had a question that you were talking about, uh, like the watering holes. Have they been closing them down like since I left and with my project? And also, second question would be, how have the like precipitation levels been uh, like since I left? Have they been increasing or decreasing? Yeah, because you were there at the end of the drought, hey? Yeah. So, um, so when you when you were here, they had um, around seventy water points open. So that's down from the three hundred and sixty they had built between the nineteen thirties and the nineteen sixties. Um, and they've actually some some of the some of those remaining seventy have just simply gone defunct. They they just haven't maintained them, uh, but they have blown up quite a few more dams. So it's, don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think two or three of the major dams have been blown up and they have been drained. Um, and that was, that was quite a big move on, on Sand Park's behalf. Um, interestingly though, um, just at the about when you guys left, um, there's real concern around the droughts and, and the impact that was having on the buffalo and the hippo populations. And so there was actually a move to open a couple of water holes just um, uh, to try and support some of these, um, these populations of large ungulates. And um, so there is, there is still some concern because there's a fence that prevents the animals moving in an east-west direction to get to um, some of the, the permanent water along the Drakensberg escarpment uh, in the west of, from the west of the park, um, that they should at least keep some water holes open during these drought periods. But in the last two years, we've actually seen pretty good rainfall. So um, actually the last three years we had, tiers of sort of average and then this year we've had exceptional rain um so you actually wouldn't you wouldn't have recognized it it was just that the grass was tall um hugely productive system and we had very we had very early rains we had very late rains and so actually the argument is that should be very good for some of the woody plants you should start seeing some of these woody plants bounce back and i know it's a little bit premature to start talking about um, those effects already, but certainly we're starting to see a lot of seedlings in some of those fenced off areas. And so it fits our model, which is ideal. Awesome. Thanks for answering. Sure. What would be ideal is if you came back and helped us with that work. I know. I'm hoping to, hoping to, uh, in 2020 or 2021, when the ban is over, I can come back. That'd be awesome. Looking forward. All right. So, uh, other questions out there. Thanks, Joey. Thanks, uh, Vivian for, uh, Speaking up, it looks like um, we've got another virtual intern that has a question. So, uh, Julia, go ahead. You are unmuted there. Hi, thank you, Lawrence, and thank you, Brooks. Um, this is kind of also about the watering holes. You mentioned that with increased density around them, there will be a decrease in population growth. Is that just simply out of um, competition for resources? And then Kind of a two-part question based on that would you expect the population to decline to like i guess like the sweet spot or like a carrying capacity type thing and maintain around that or yeah it's hard to say um so it's it's very much a wait and see policy so i mean that's what strategic adaptive management is is that you affect uh, a management um 
policy and then you treat it as an experiment and you stand back and watch to, to, to see what the results look like. And, and certainly the closure of waterholes is, and it's a density dependent effect and it's a, you know, it's a pattern that's common across most faunal communities, um, experimentally and naturally. Um, as soon as the animals start running out of resources, you see a decline uh, in, in, their, in their growth rates. Um, and the mechanism is, is, um, is, is easy to observe, in, particularly during the drought periods where animals don't carry the babies to term because they, uh, they lose condition. And it's the same for elephants. Um, and so in some parts of the park, the lambda, the population growth rate has dropped to around 2%. Um, elephants are like, um, they're just the most incredibly resilient thing. So, so the same rate at which the traffic increases in Los Angeles, which is around 6%, we saw the same rate of increase in the elephant population. So a doubling every 10 years. Um, but that's declined in some parts of the park to around 2%. So the sweet spot is tough. Um, what you really want to, what, what many of the managers are hoping to see is the decline in the population to the point where you're starting to see a decline in, in the, these ecological effects that sort of as ecosystem engineers, do we start seeing a decline in the rate of the loss of trees or um, uh, the impact on, on uh, other aspects of the vegetation? So we actually don't know yet. We, don't, we, haven't, we haven't done that work, but at least the trajectory is it's, it's moving in the right direction. Um, but it's a bit like contraception. You're never going to see a negative, or the, the argument is it's unlikely to see a negative population growth rate, but we'll see. Uh, and certainly that, that population growth rate just in the last, I think it's in the last eight years, has gone from six to two percent in some parts of the park so i was skeptical initially and now you know the data are starting to show a real change so it might well work the question is whether it'll work fast enough to uh conserve you know there, there's certainly some parts of the park where people are concerned about vulnerable plant communities so in the far north the very arid parts of the park where we see most of the baobabs and these big succulent trees sticulias and uh, camifras there is some concern in those parts and also uh, in the south of the park where it's a lot wetter. Um, we got, we're particularly concerned about those areas. So those would be the canary in the mine for uh, elephant effects. But for the rest of the park, not, not too bad as yet. The, the big question, of course, is um, the biodiversity decline that you see in, in the basalts. Are we seeing that elsewhere in the park and, and, and not really, not yet? Okay. Thank you. Good question. Good questions. Um, anyone else out there? I know we've got a few alumni. I think we've got a few uh, prospective participants in the future. Um, all right. Looks like Bree has a question. Bree, be there? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, okay. My question is can you expand on um, like what the best timing of rain is for large trees and why and since elephants are mixed feeders do they would they have some kind of best rain regime since they don't really if they're not as worried about whether they're eating grass or munching on leaves and fruit from trees uh, so so the best um so from what from what you understand, the best for woody plants would be well, there are the two elements. The so one is consistent rain throughout the year, and particularly late, late rain. Um, the germination of the seeds is largely dependent on, on the breaking of dormancy, and that's whether it's passing through an elephant or, in most cases, for savanna trees, is moisture. So they need to be buried, they need to be wet, and the seed coat will crack. And so, so germination is one thing; it's cued largely. Uh, by moisture in the soil, uh, but the the potential for that seedling, that germinant, to become established, is very dependent on late rain. So you need the soil to be very very wet, and as it starts drying down, um, or sorry, drying down, um, if you have another f late pulse of rain, uh, it just gives it that extra bit of resources in order for the taproot to reach um, the water table. So consistent and late rain. Uh, is, is important for the establishment of woody plants. But also the argument is that in the dry periods, um, particularly towards the end of a drought cycle, um, once the, the browsers start to decline in the system, so uh, even in this last drought, we only really had three intense years, 
you start to see a dramatic decline in um, buffalo, fildepiest, zebra populations, but also some of the impala. Um, the idea is that um, towards the end of a sort of a particularly intense long drought period, you should um, there might be a window of opportunity for those uh, woody plant seedlings to uh, shoot through the browse trap. Um, this latest drought, and we, we've tagged a lot of seedlings, and we're looking at the, uh, um, the demography of many of these um, big tree species, the drought just wasn't long enough. So we only had a three year period, and we're looking to see what would happen once the impala populations really crashed, or the elephant populations really crashed, did we start seeing uh, the rebounding of some of these woody plant populations, and the drought didn't last long enough. So when the rest of the country was hoping for the drought to break, we were quite keen for it to last. Um, and as far as seedlings and, and elephants and seedlings go, I was, I was also very skeptical until I did some field work in the far north of the park with an MSE student, MSC student who was looking at the, um, the fluctuations and the population dynamics of the floodplain forests of the uh, Fredhobia and, and uh, fever trees. And we watched this elephant move through a population of seedlings, just literally like one by one plucking the seedlings at the end of the dry season. So the seedlings is a lot more palatable than, than the adults and obviously a lot more accessible. But one elephant ate about 60 seedlings, so literally just picking from there, which couldn't believe our eyes. So they actually do have a big impact. And, and so much so that um, between the elephants and the, and the uh, impala, we just see absolutely no seedlings or baobabs in the far north of the park. So elephants can have a huge impact on, on, on the seedlings as well. Thanks. Sure. Okay. I thought you were going to ask me a termite question. <laughs> I think I got that covered. <laughs> you do, you do. Sorry, Brooks? No, it's all good, it's all good. Um, any, anyone else out there with questions for Lawrence? Now's your, time, now's your chance. And uh, actually, it looks like uh, we've got a question here in the chat from Miranda, she asks, um, how is the park management taking into account how these changes, whether that be the water hole closures, changes in fire management, removal of earth dams, and changes in plant homogeneity affect other vulnerable species in the park other than elephants? So it's, that's a bit of a tough one. They, um, so Crook has decided to adopt a, a, a landscape um, or systems ecology approach to the management of the park. And um, some parks are very focused on individual species. So if you go to Botswana, it's still very species specific conservation, but the Kruger policy is largely driven by um, maintaining ecosystem integrity. And their key metric would be heterogeneity. And um, so, and, and the argument that we make in a lot of the work that we're doing is that by elephants depressing vegetation structure, we've seen this trophic cascade and the potential loss of vulnerable species. Um, the park has, the, the, the managers and the, the research scientists in the park haven't seen that uh, across the entire park as yet. And as soon as they start seeing that, then, then you're likely to start seeing uh, more significant elephant management. Um, so they, I, I think the feeling is that while we're starting to see local influences, so um, the elephants feeding on succulent trees in the far north. You're starting to see an extirpation of those species in parts of the landscape, but they, they do have refuge in very, very steep parts, very steep slopes on the top of mountains and, and so on. And so, um, you know, that was raised as a flag some 10 years ago, but the argument is that the, most of those species are still fine. Um, there are no red data species uh, or particularly vulnerable species that are currently a threat um, uh, by, by the elephant effects and so on. So until that happens, we're not likely to see that trigger response from the, uh, from the conservation managers. Um, but I think in some parts of the park, they are, they, they're starting to feel like um, we should at least start thinking about managing. And so they're testing all kinds of uh, management techniques, the use of chilies, uh, which some of the OTS students have done, uh, the use of bees, which another group of OTS students have done. Um, there's also disturbance culling. Um, there are all kinds of interesting ideas around um, using irritating noise of subsonic irritant noises to, to keep elephants out of areas. So 
the landscape of fear becomes a, an important tool uh, in this instance. So they certainly start to trial some of those thoughts. And interestingly, human voices are um, the key instrument in um, this landscape of fear idea. So we've looked at chilies, hasn't really worked. We've looked at bees, didn't really work. And it can't really work in a place like Kruger, this is too big. And so what they, what um, some of the researchers are now thinking about doing is, is broadcasting human voices. And uh, that certainly has traction. So in other parts of South Africa, uh, just north of Pretoria, and uh, close to Polokwane, they're finding that um, if you play um, human voices, particularly people who've been in the landscape for, for millennia, so um, mostly um, um, Guni speaking people and Guni in Guni voices, uh, languages, um, they actually elephants flee the area. And so that's, they, they start to think about using that in both rhino management and, and elephant management. So rhino management, because they want to keep rhinos out of the, uh, the, the poaching hotspot areas and they want to keep elephants out of some of these areas where communities are vulnerable. Very good. Very good. For uh, those of you that didn't see, um, Don Tai uh, shared a, a resource for an article uh, relevant to some of the elephants in Kruger as well in the chat window. So take a look at that. Um, I think we have, uh, Lawrence, I know you could keep going, but I think we have reached uh, the, the end of our talk here. Um, great job. Thank you everyone for joining us. We realize that, um, you know, these are challenging times for everyone. And um, we do appreciate everyone taking the time to join us today. Uh, we will, we've recorded the, the talk today. Uh, we will share it with everyone who's registered. So if you want to rewatch something, you can. We'll also be sharing it uh, on our social media uh, accounts as well at Tropical Studies. Uh, and we hope to do more of these in the future. So a um, few of you alumni that are out there listening, you know, if you've got some really cool, um, you know, cutting end research projects that you've, you know, either done with OTS or um, it doesn't even have to be with OTS, but since you're alumni, we'd love to hear uh, more about what you're working on. Uh, we'd like to do more of these, uh, and we hope that the OTS community, as broad and far-reaching as it is, uh, would be willing to share um, some, of, some of your research or some of your work. So Lawrence was, 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 um, was happy enough, uh, lucky enough to be the, the guinea pig today. So I want to thank you, Lawrence, for, uh, for doing this. We know that it's... Uh, it's almost one o'clock there in South Africa, so I guess we'll let you go to bed. And um, thank you again to everyone for joining us and uh, stay safe. Nice to see you all. Cheers, guys. <laughs>